Um, so we have a bio lab that's been running for a few years now where we are doing primarily 3D bioprinting. Mm -hmm. So we released an open source 3D bioprinter mm -hmm. and we do actually process optimization and uh, extruder development for specialized purposes. So we work with research labs and so forth and we create mechanisms, um, hardware, software um, and the material preparation procedures to 3d print some customized solutions uh, or yeah actually materials in whatever shape they want what's your revenue model right now are you getting self-sustained by sales or this is from grants and things no so it's all sales uh how many people you got right now with you at yeah 10, 10 people full time and this is all ignas uh exactly yeah uh-huh yeah very cool so, what's your revenue right now? Like, how, how well are you doing? Are you hiring people? Well, still? we, yeah, so we are continuously growing. We are sustainable and we're now moving more towards the industrial solutions where there's bigger revenue potential. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you sell in the Caruza, the, the actual, the pro editions, is that selling or is that struggling? Or? So, that is uh, a technology previous system. So this is what we are uh, putting out there on the market uh, to demonstrate the technology. Mm -hmm. um, but really the time for wireless optical systems is just becoming right. Uh, so as a field overall, it's just maturing. So we were one of the earlier ones with say newer modern designs and yeah, this year, next year, we expect to see some growth in that sector. And and but the pro edition of Caruza is that the product you're you're working on or like enhancing or different? Um, we are mostly working in transferring that technology to other partners that will then have products. So so literally the last mile routers. Um, yeah, or just different kinds of similar devices to Cruza. So with Cruza, we are really just showing the technology, and then there will be multiple versions with different partners for whatever applications they will have. And these are different, either last mile connection options or uh, quite some other industrial applications. Yeah. Hmm. And what's the, and, and, but at present, like if I wanted to try to replicate that, that's not really... You said it's not really at that state of replication. Um, it wouldn't be easy. You can try to do it, but if you're not like a trained professional in the wireless optical field, it may be quite a challenge mm -hmm. because there's a lot of steps required in terms of calibration and process and understanding how the technology works. Um, so from that perspective, it's just a stretch as such uh, to do it. Uh -huh. And if one had the knowledge, the Car Caruza, the initial version that's public, that's published, how much is the bill of materials on that? Um, it's like a grand or a bit more. So that, that depends on what's available. Mm -hmm. But overall, I would not suggest replication of that without design updates because it's yeah. too old, more or less. For the new systems for wireless optical, what's what's your price point that you're trying to get to, or, or your, the companies are trying to get to, to be compatible um, with regular routers, regular wireless, or no? Uh, no, so it's not entirely clear what will happen on the market and if mm -hmm. this technology will ever get to like last mile access. Wow, well, yeah. So does uh, the <laughs> shuttle work now? Uh, have a have a share of your company or? Is that how that worked out? Just curious about that. Um, yeah, so we have a non-profit, which, yeah, there's no shares of because there's no owners per se. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have a for-profit where, yeah, there's a part set aside. Oh, sorry. Is, in the for-profit part, is Shuttleworth a partner in there? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And you're running, so you founded Irnas, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, that's pretty good. Um, I was gonna say, uh, there's a practical, very practical consideration on the fibers, the optical stuff. Actually, right now I have because actually yesterday we finally got off the slow lane. We had four meg internet here, which I'm using right now. 
Yesterday we okay. had our one gig fiber finally. So Sorry. we wanna <laughs> we wanna put fiber in. Do you know of um, can we do where once they put the modem in a house, is there copper to fiber that's affordable right now? Mm, so, sorry, how do you mean copper to fiber? Yeah, what what do you want to connect? So I'm, I'm assuming the modem will be such that where they bring the fiber in, the modem is there, and then you p plug in a regular router to that. Is there a way to, exactly. then, yeah, to then go, uh, if we wanted to put fiber instead of wireless, because we've got about um, 400, let's see, 500, 600 meters to go to the remote parts of the campus here. Sure. Uh, is there a way to do it with fiber? So to go yeah, from you the can. router to fiber? Can build your own fiber network if you want. Um, is that expensive? Mm, no. <clears throat> Sorry, not that much. If you will dig your own trenches and lay fiber, like fiber itself is cheap. Yeah. And also the uh, SFP receivers and things like that. But then again, on your own campus, if you take like ubiquity Wi-Fi equipment or something like that, you will get three or four hundred megabytes of through through that quite easily, and you can do a wireless link of a few hundred meters, no problem. Um, do you so price-wise, well, you really can do it wireless and get reasonable performance. Reasonable performance, like, um, would you? Would you see a case for fiber if we've got the ability to trench and do that? I mean, it seems like it would be more reliable under various conditions, right? If you bury the cable. True, but I would argue that the reliability is none of your issues because you're not using it for anything mission critical. And if it goes out for 10 minutes a year or something like that, it may not be worth the extra effort. And with trenching and like if you will be digging something up in your property and all of that, it's more likely you will damage the cable than the wireless link. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it really depends on the applications what you will have in different buildings. But if it's just normal internet access, I would just do it wirelessly because it's cheaper, easier, and more like versatile. Mm -hmm. um, and if we wanted. Is it also cheaper and easier if we wanted a one gig connection? Because that's that's what we have here. Um, yeah, so for one gig, you pay a bit more for wireless uh, equipment. So at that point, it starts making sense to run fiber. But if you're happy with a few hundred megabytes, it's perfectly fine. Uh, just use Wi-Fi equipment. Yeah, yeah. No, we plan on having a lot of throughput here, so probably it might might be worth looking into the fiber stuff can you point to um like okay say we have a router uh where the current system is and we want to go to the fiber from that is there a particular sure. part that um <clears throat> what's the device called it's uh it's still called oh, you need to play you need a media converter essentially so you need two pieces of media converter which it has ethernet port on one end and fiber output on the other, and then you just need to run fiber. Uh-huh. Uh, how much are those, do you know? Um, 20 bucks, 30 bucks, something like that. Oh. oh Plus great. the SAP module. Yeah, like TP-Link makes cheap ones. What's it called? Um, T uh, let me give you the part number. If you say look up... Um, MC two hundred CM, for example. MC two hundred CM. Yeah, oh. this works reasonably well to like a few hundred meters distance. I like you give it. Uh, you can get different options, uh, like MC two two zero L, and then you can put in an SFP module which is essentially the fiber module, and with that, you can run for a few kilometers. Hmm. What's the ladder? MC2... MC220L. 220L.
What's what's like on the side of just this equipment? Is it as easy as that? That that's the media converter. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about essentially twice that plus your arm. That's it plus the cable. Yeah, exactly. Oh, that, I mean that sounds <clears throat> pretty doable. Yeah, that, that's doable. The the bigger problem is you need to get the cable. You need to you know run it between buildings. You need to get the fiber connector splice to it and so forth. So that's a bit oh. extra work, and you will need for someone to come in and yeah install right. the connectors. Because the current thing is where you the, to put the terminals on the fiber. What is that like a twenty five thousand yeah. dollar machine that does that? It's not that much, but. It got a bit cheaper, but still, you need a specialized tool for that. Uh huh. What's there? There's no good DIY way of fiber splicing, as far as I know. There is none, right? There, I don't know of one at least. Right. Uh huh. Yeah. Because you need to do precise core alignment and things like that. So, um, that yeah. would be quite a cool project to design at some point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. You know, the way we think is that, you know, make it accessible to anyone. I mean, I think this is a very practical application. Someone's got a facility. Uh, they can do that uh, relatively easily, like especially in our case. I mean, that's a perfect case in point right here. You just take 600 meters and do a super reliable connection like that. If you're actually building, you know, building the infrastructure and you want to reduce cost as we do, I think it does make a lot of sense. Um, but can you then get, I'm assuming that you can probably get the optical cable that's got the two terminals on it, right? <clears throat> uh, yeah, the problem it comes just when you want to run the cable, if it's pre-connectorized, yeah. it's hard not to break it. Oh, because what, you're talking about the trenching part? and, and Yeah, yeah because through. you need to unwind the whole thing. Yeah, that. no, I see. I see. There, there's a few, like a few tools and connectors, which you, where you don't need a tool, but you can kind of just clamp it on fiber, and it kind of makes a good connection. Uh huh. But I'm not sure how far along that is, or how, yeah, useful it is. I not see. Seen, be used many times. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. And have you done that yourself? Well, the splicing, yeah, sure. Do you have the tool? No. You, you no, just outsource that just borrow it. come in? I borrow it, or, you know, I used to do it at the university where we had that. I see. Yeah. Well, what's that tool called? Do they sell that on Amazon, or that's pretty special? Yeah, it's just fiber splicing. Yeah. Fiber splicer. To. And um, yeah, like you can buy it even from China, and not oh, yeah. that expensive at the end of the day. But two, three grand, like I guess you can get something. But yeah, proper fusion spices will will be a bit more. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm seeing like. Easy Splicer, FORC, Easy 7, 1875. Uh-huh. And what's the challenge to that when you do that? Is it is it about, like, when you cut the ends, do you have to polish the ends? Yeah, so you need to cut them nicely, you need to polish them, then you need to bring them together, and then there's usually, a, like, an automatic stage which will precise align them, check them with the camera. Uh-huh. Uh, and then you will... It will yeah, just check the alignment and all that, make sure there's no loss, and then it will laser weld, etc. Oh, it laser welds and welds the yeah. actual glass. Exactly, yeah. Oh, wow. And that's all in that little tool? Yeah, oh, it's wow. very neat and optimized. Yeah, nice. Um, yeah. Yeah, fiber splicing is yeah a fun project. I, I'm just googling if there's something open source. Fiber open fiber. source. I haven't found it. Yeah, that would be a good project. Um, and 
talking about projects, what other stuff are you doing? Like, if there's any collaboration we could do. So I've, one of the things we got is the universal access, which right now we're really perfecting the 3D printer. We've built the CNC circuit mill that works reliably. We got a paper on that. Um, but we're trying to scale that. The next steps are to scale that to the larger machines. So your larger precision, heavy duty CNC machining, as well as standard stuff like the torch tables. But is there, mm -hmm. are you developing your, uh, some open source production machinery as well? Mm, no, not at the moment, except 3D bioprinters. Mm -hmm. um, because we shifted to industrial grade machinery as we need the precision. Um, so, yeah, we, we can't do it with the tools we've built before. Uh, industrial grade machinery, are you talking about for making the, making your Caruso Pro systems? Yeah, and plenty of other things because we need, you know, a hundredth of a millimeter precision and so forth. What kind of tools uh, so do you have? We have vertical milling centers and CNC routers, so industrial grade, so where we get the required precision. It's yeah. like machines with, you know, multiple tons of steel, so. Yeah. For the precision, the precision. Uh, for the precision that you typically need, uh... What what is that precision? Um, it will be a few hundreds of a millimeter. That would be that's uh, you want if you want to melt on the where that's. Um, let me see. So you're talking about a few hundreds, so so like ten, twenty micron. Mm, yeah, hundred, exactly. It's yeah, exactly. A hundred, maybe fifty micron. Yeah, you can do fifty micron as well. But still, that's yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're going that, for like one two mil something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going for. I like to see the our heavier duty stuff go to about ten micron. That'll be good. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah I'll be good. Uh, that's quite challenging in the process, even just getting the parts. So. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, and see. given like how cheap we can get the machines, like secondhand, there is just not worth the effort. Usually, yeah, it's more. I think like one of the better strategies would be, and what we find is that. Like you can get ver still very good mechanically sound milling centers on the market for like for quite cheap, between like five and ten grand. It's just that the control systems are like twenty years old and are super outdated. So the there's probably a strategy where a lot of value would be added to be able to convert all those essentially old milling centers to some sufficiently advanced open source control system where you could then with improved software actually be much better at machining things. Yeah, yeah. Did you put in your own software or did you just use what stock they had? No, we just used the stock solution, which is horrible to be honest on the machine we have because it has very limited code size and all that. Um, so we're looking to upgrade shortly. Yeah. Um, the whole machine but still like if this one had better control system we could do way more with it yeah yeah and i also saw you you so you've been involved with people like like glia yeah yeah so we've been working with them uh, on the uh ecg and pulse oximeter and so forth huh what's the status of the ecg um yeah it's in development but will be operational very shortly yeah that sounds pretty good and and is it true that they I, I noticed on their internet they have a filament maker so they're making they're turning scrap plastic into filament for their medical devices mm, yeah so they're doing that in Gaza as far as I know yeah which is by the way the first example I know of of the precious plastic system doing anything for actually making 3d printing filament yeah, and I'm not sure if they use pressure plastic or something else, because it might be just something else. 
Uh, but yeah, they're making their own film and then printing like stethoscopes and stuff like that. Yeah, I saw the the post on um, <clears throat> on their Facebook, and it it was the precious plastic system. So that was okay. really encouraging, actually. That some real really good use for that. Um, and you're in contact with those people. Yeah, we work with them daily, essentially. Yeah, can you? Um, can you link me to somebody who worked on a precious plastic thing? Because we're that's one of the things we're building too far infrastructure, basically a higher throughput version of that. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, who's, who's yeah, so we, we'll need to ask Tarek, or you can ask Tarek directly. Uh -huh. um, he's, yeah, and he can point you to someone in Gaza who was dealing with that, I believe. Is Tarek, is he in Canada? Uh, yeah, usually he is, so I'm not sure if at the moment or not. Uh, do you have his email, or do you, do you want to email that to me? Yeah, sure. Yeah, no, that'll be good. Um, when, for example, with, with the current Caruso system, have you considered the idea of, of pumping that through fiber as well for longer distances? Or that's like a whole... No, no that, that's what we're doing. We're taking a fiber system and making it wireless optical. So there's, yeah, if you take what we built away and put fiber in between, you got the system I gave you the part numbers before, more or less. Uh, you're saying... If you buy the media converters and things that you were looking at earlier and you connect fiber, this is the baseline of our system. Have you done? Are you doing that with fiber? So, so you got. No, so we, we don't use any fiber, but we use the same components as if you were using fiber. There's just no fiber in the wireless optical system. Right, and I'm saying, like, would it? Would there be any interest in extending range by using fiber? Sorry, I don't understand what you mean. Well, I mean, I'm assuming that with the type of laser you have in there, if you pump it through a fiber, you'd be able to extend a distance like way beyond 100 meters, no? Exactly, but what we are using is actual fiber. So it is the actual laser that's built to connect to fiber and to be used for that application. So the, the source of what we built is a fiber that is by default you so it's the laser that's used by default with fiber that connects buildings together oh is that so you uh-huh okay I see. we use a fiber system as the like core building Feed. component are you feeding does that mean you're feeding a fiber into your cruiser mm, not not exactly but to the first approximation yes Right. Um, I mean, is there does does what I just said like okay, yeah. So you're gone. You say you're feeding fiber. Let's say if you just wanted to have a, a low cost way to use your system as a basically the the light sources and receivers for light signal over fiber. Does is there any use case for that or any any interest in that kind of a thing? Or that just doesn't make sense so much. No, that does not make sense at all, because if you forget our system, it is just a media converter and the SFP module, so the part numbers I told you about yeah. you know, a few minutes ago, exactly that. which you would use between two buildings. Exactly. In other words, it does not make sense to use yours, because yours is much more complicated, where you can get these very simple things. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we use those simple things to build our more complicated system. I see. Yeah. What is the power required? We're talking about the scale of milliwatts per mile. What in terms of optical power or yeah, optical power? Consumption? power. <clears throat> How much sure power is that? like milliwatt? One milliwatt transmitted, then that will get get you like eighty kilometers or something like that. One milliwatt for about eighty kilometers. Yeah, roughly. Mm -hmm. And that's single mode. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, multi mode doesn't go really far. 
Yeah. Yeah. Is there... Yeah, let's see. I mean... Um, the thing that... Uh, just, just want to update you on one thing. So, uh, with the big question of how do you get hardware to... to to be successful like software, because software is the default right now, whereas hardware, no, it's literally unheard of. Uh, w one thing we're working on, so we're planning on a design challenge where we take a common product that lends itself to crowd development and develop a professional grade version of it that can be deployed in a distributed enterprise way. Uh, so basically an incentive design challenge to do a thing like, so we're, we've actually been discussing the cordless drill as a case in point. For thing that's a ten billion dollar market, and you can deploy the open source method to develop an open business around that, and basically do a product better than the industry standard or you know, equivalent or pretty much distributed market substitution. So that's one thing we're working on, and we'll do a, an incentive challenge on it. But basically, the idea is we have to show one or a few things that. You can say, okay, we deployed this in a fully open source hardware way, and it actually makes sense economically for a lot of people. Now, the 3D printer has shown that already, but nobody noticed, and it's actually a little complicated with 3D, 3D printer. But yeah, this that case of showing the viable economics of open source hardware, yeah, that's that's still to be shown for the world. Um, well, I'm you know I'm approaching this from maybe a different perspective. So if we take a cordless drill, right? Yeah. And if we assume we have a, the perfect design, yeah. the most resource optimal way is to make it centralized. Obviously, we're not after the most resource optimal way, but most yeah, most practical, which may as well be distributed. Um, so I'd first evaluate if it would make sense to make a good open source design, say a cordless drill or something else, and inject it in the current manufacturing chain, essentially. So you would first get it manufactured in the same centralized way it's being done at the moment, um, but making sure it's an open design, and then in the next iteration you could, you know, spread it manufacturing-wise or distributed manufacturing-wise. Is that w what your strategy currently is? Not necessarily, but we're seeing that you know these things are happening anyway, and there's a lot of not open source called open sourcing, at least in the tools manufacturing. Um, at least from the cordless drills we have, they're from like multiple manufacturers. So as one more like known manufacturer phases out the model, it appears as a no name brand with of essentially the same quality, slightly different colors and things like that. Uh, so there, there's a lot of that happening. It's just not necessarily called open source. Right. But then you got to ask, you know, what is the, the end goal? The end goal would be to distribute economic power far and wide, right? So does the case of, a, of an open source design feeding the central manufacturing system uh, show a good direction as I would say yes as long as then uh, that process leads to the distribution like as in there's not four manufacturers of cordless drills like Black and Decker, Ryobi and a few others worldwide but there's hundreds thousands possibly thousands yes possibly millions so um, sure and would that be a desirable state because to me it seems like okay the more you can distribute that economic power to more agents that's called democracy or a better society um what are your, well, what are your I, thoughts I on that you on the distribution part i don't agree with you on the efficiency part yeah because while it may be distributed and you know great and all that it's not efficient in the process. So the more you have, the least efficient the process is. Um, are you uh, count, counting the possibility of life cycle stewardship? Like, for example, the people are equipped with small, small micro factories, and they're, for example, recycling plastic or taking the products back, or people using them for a life. The, the, to me, the, the main proposition of value 
is the lifetime aspect where now a person can modify, upgrade, fix their product, right? So how do you think you can achieve that kind of level? Because that to me is environmental stewardship, right? That then you get really ecological. Um, I, I just am not seeing centralized operations evolve to that at least yet. We might have to push them with open source competition like this. Yeah, so I, again, agree with you on this point. Now I just have to get to the, yeah, to some good output. Um, I'm not really sure if just starting, you know, a whole new, like, parallel world of open source manufacturing will make the rapid change we would like to see, or at least significant um, on the short term. Um, again, back to cordless drill, except like getting the exact spare part for it. And actually, if there was a way to always get the spare parts for the next like 20 years for every cord cordless drill you would buy, that would be quite efficient until it breaks beyond uh, the point of uh, repair. But then again, also, all these units are so highly integrated that there's not much to fix. So obviously, a better design would make it more fixable. Um, and that may be, from the user perspective, more appealing. Um, if you make it in the center, like or centralized way, it wouldn't matter to the user as much as it being serviceable for a long time or something along the lines. Yeah. Would you say that therefore that's that's achievable in an open source or or no? What what's your point on that? Could be like one of the ideas could also be that say after I don't know two or three or five years, um, essentially any design or product would need to be open source for the longevity of like the. Uh, design and to keep it serviceable when the warranty is beyond the date or something like that. Although that directly clashes with like planned obsolescence and the business models overall come. So I would expect a significant pushback if that is successful in any way. Oh yeah, absolutely. But um, why do you claim that um... Uh, from a resource efficiency perspective, because I wouldn't agree with that. I mean, you just mentioned planned obsolescence, right? I mean, that's where the resource efficiency really hits. It's where you have to start from scratch and going to the, the dump site versus uh, actually reusing that. So, so in principle, 10x efficiency of material use. Uh, would you still say that resource optimal way would be centralized? I mean, I think you're assuming that in a centralized way, you would have to build in the recycling or reuse infrastructures, right? Yes, sure. Yeah, but that's, I mean, right now, um, is that likely to happen right now? Mm. If I'm not entirely really sure, but there's quite a bit of that happening, at least in Europe and so forth. Yeah. Um, like in terms of recycling, like trash is becoming valuable essentially. So that's happening to an extent. Yeah. Uh, but it's really down at like the basic materials level. So once the product is expired, you need to essentially disassemble them, you know, mill them into basic pieces and then start again from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. No, you Which... have to get down. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can't really use the, reuse the components anyway because if you try to insert like used components in a scale efficient manufacturing process, just the quality control steps are very painful. Oh yeah, oh yeah, um, yeah. You'd have to rip it down, melt it down, plastic, exactly. steel, all that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are you? Uh, are you going to, so there's a show with meeting coming up. Uh, do you go to those these days or? Yeah, I tend to go to all of them as they're quite valuable as well as, uh, you know, I w work with a lot of the fellows, so it's a good get together. Yeah, 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 no, that's, that's good. Yeah. 
You haven't um, been probed already. No, I haven't. I, I've been in the trenches here. I, I do want to go. Uh, when When is the next one? Uh, it's in May in Latvia. Latvia, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, no, I gotta go. I gotta get my way. Make my way out there uh, to one of the next ones. Um, do you see any, um, I don't know, in, in terms of any collaborative projects, does anyone, anything come to mind? What? Yeah, so I think we, we need to kind of work things out uh, in more detail. I don't have a really clear idea what could uh, happen, how we could uh, collaborate or, you know, make this beneficial for both parties efficiently. Um, so it would be good to understand a bit more what you guys are doing like beyond the 3D printing now um, and like the more you know, tractor farm type equipment you've started. We're taking it essentially at the level of the 3D printer which gets us up to plastic parts and rubber so we're talking about 20 pound per day printing rates which then becomes relevant to things like tractor seats, furniture, actual rubber tires and tracks so we're starting with okay. the 3d printer because that's going to get us to the low cost on the other things so from the 3d printer you just extend that up to the torch table part which means that now sure. we're cutting metal using the same the still universal access system so building that sure. up from scratch like that so, so we get a solid foundation and pretty soon after that getting to the precision machining but as well as the metal melting part so the induction furnace all of that uh, the promise being uh, I think we're like 1.6 million dollars away from being able to produce a tractor for 500 dollars a full-size tractor when you count in essentially that it's largely automated and then some of your labor uh, but yeah like 500 dollars in parts for because but then doesn't include like engine or oh, it does that. it would does. So we're talking about yeah yeah I mean I really want to go to we got to start doing that, so that's part of the plan. So with the precision machining, we're getting to all those processes. I'm try trying to bootstrap in a very fundamental way on that. So that's the current approach, but using the 3D printer, since there's a good revenue model there, uh, just using that to bootstrap fund with the idea that we set up anyone who works at OSC, we pretty much have them do like nine days of 3D printer work, meaning either running workshops or in production and the rest is R&D so that's that's the current thing uh, that we're trying to do okay. therefore putting up a store online and things like that so kind of like and you're selling your branded products essentially or yeah yeah we're selling them uh, a lot of times we so we've done a lot of things like like the CD home build or various builds that we do in extreme manufacturing way where we swarm swarm build them like the CD home that we built. Um, let me see, let me, have you seen the CD home? Um, don't think so. No. Let me show you a picture of that. Um, okay, so that's. Let me paste that in the chat. So, th for example, um, that CD home there. It's in the chat. Fifty people, five days. Yeah. And right now we're building up to being able to deploy that as a regular enterprise but that's a little okay. bit down the road because we want to also have once again when we're actually building it use our own tractors and equipment to do the foundations and other things and really like with the 3d printer infrastructure we do want to print out a lot of the large-scale panels four by eight panels at a rate of like okay. current, current industry standard for large nozzles is up to 20 pounds a day like 10 kilos a day that you can extrude through a single okay. nozzle. Uh, but that, I mean, the goal there is, okay, polycarbonate, wood, plastic, composites, do all of that through 3D printing. So so include a lot of the 3D printed stuff in the house build, but also at the same time, we've got the brick machine, which does the bricks. So uh, really try to push the limit of eco-production and getting to the materials, uh, recycling and reuse. So that's the roadmap. And right now the, the main thing is develop the replicable funding model which means uh, calling it extreme enterprise so, so very efficient production of printers so for example uh, I've shown in initial evidence we can build 12 quality controlled printers um, in a three-day period 
so about four to eight okay. per day, which is actually uh, three to ten times better than industry standard. If that works, that means we've got a an extreme enterprise. But like for example, if you take Crusa printers, they do about a, sure. a printer per day per person per day. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we can do about four printers per person per day using our methods. So trying to okay. do that to to make it a viable model and and I can what do is it. What's the price model for that? I have then? to teach others to do it. Yeah, go ahead. What's the price model then uh, of the uh, printers? The price like... model there is a sale price of eight hundred dollars for a five hundred dollar bill of materials printer. So we're talking about three hundred bucks per sale. And basically yeah, but making... that. But does that so that includes assembly? Does that include that would be the core? kit form? That that would be like a, a a quality control kit. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But still, does that that include the support process? Yeah, does that does. include uh, the, the development costs, reinvestment, and things like that? Uh, it includes uh, the following: one is one day of production to to actually do it. Second day is packaging that for shipping. Third day is that we're accounting for customer support. So okay. that is included. As far as the R and D, that's that's not accounted in there because that's a uh, you know building off open source. Okay. Still, but so you're currently like three person days per printer then, if I understand correctly. Uh, no, um, one. If that's tw for twelve printers, so there's like three or four days. Okay. For twelve printers, so that's that's the model, as far as the specific ergonomics of production. So like three or four printers per day per person. So that that's the model I'm working on right now to get all that production engineering in place on that and then make it replicable. So that's going to be the challenge of how we actually teach that and set up other people so that we can do that. We tried last year, we didn't we didn't succeed. Uh, I hired a couple of people, but we couldn't we couldn't do it. Um, okay. Couldn't teach people fast enough and we didn't have the marketing in place or anything. But yeah, trying that as just basically taking a common product that's that's uh, fully open source and just really do the extreme manufacturing on the production, meaning the extremely efficient manufacturing ergonomics on a small scale. Because I still want to do the thing like I I, I don't want to do the, the centralized production thing. I want to see that the distributed model is actually viable as uh, actually a more efficient alternative. It has to be. So otherwise we're we're in central production all the time. But I believe that the distributed way that's just got altogether more more benefit on different levels. So yeah, I agree with that. It's just with the three printers, I think it's particularly difficult to figure it out, given there's just so many of them and right, so many right. cheaper Chinese yeah. versions. Right, and it's really hard to like if we assume that someone is not aligning with your values and the way the printer is produced and just wants a good printer yeah will they buy your printer or not or you know, yeah that's why actually the assumption buy yeah. Our printer? yeah i think the assumption has to be that we're we're meeting our exceeding industry standards at a fraction of the cost so basically that would mean that a person would have to choose ours over a two thousand dollar lulz butt printer you know so sure or a more expensive other printer yeah it does assume that so yeah. so we have to meet a baseline of industrial efi uh, efficiency as far as the performance of the machine itself but also keep in mind that if you want to compete with lulzbot yeah uh, say a two grand printer you can best do that if you sell yours for like one and a half grand yeah 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 that that may be the case and, and why do you say that because it's in the same price performance range and it's easier to make a decision. Yeah. Whereas you're way out of the range. You are, when someone compares the printers, you're closer to the, oh yeah, Chinese clone range than like a serious yeah. right. product. So that's a marketing point. Yeah. So the price points have to be, uh, we'll renegotiate them. That's what we're doing right now with uh, where we're at right now. Uh, but yeah, we'll, We'll have to reevaluate the price structure, but not, not just the price structure. So I would say, like part of your well problem or solution actually is 
doing the same you know efficient amount of marketing or you know good business strategy than you did with the development yeah 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 because uh, generally we see like the products that are successful is uh, half the product and the other half is actually good sales i agree with you yeah yeah that's a recognition that i i also came to yeah it's all and, yeah i mean yeah. you know simply said uh marx forgot that all value is redeemed at a point of sale so yeah yeah we got to do that <laughs> Yeah, and if we say, you know, just take, again, just run a bit more with the three printer case. Yeah. Is, um, if you have, like, one web shop, you know, selling this, it all comes out perfect quality, everyone is happy with it, you will have, a, like, a self-sustainable business, but that, it can also mean that they're built in, like, every state in the U.S. locally and, you know, shipped locally or whatever. Like, yeah. Whichever way you set it up. Um, so I would assume that could happen quite organically. But you're saying as given a threat that, or as a benefit? As you know, just as the way you want to organize your production, more or less. Um, That's what we want. And but also with the price model you have at the moment, I think you should really add a large chunk of that to distributed quality control. May be more expensive than the labor itself. Um, yeah, yeah. The distributed quality control is that's the part to work out because I mean we can quality control here, and now how does that happen in a distributed sense? That's uh, can that's I ask the challenge. Are you, do you personally quality control, or do you have a mechanism which runs without your involvement for? No, right control? now we're too early. This is um, I do it. So one okay. is define the procedures, then to implement them in a in a replicable way. So we're getting to the replicable way, get, getting to implementing that in a way that the people would not be here. We could have some people here doing that, but the idea is that people are doing that in their own garage or their own facility. So sure. Yeah. Let's say if we take a, a bit more of an extreme case, we can take an ISO standard, for example which a manufacturer can be certified to have like repeatable output and control, but um, which has all the steps and things like that as the extreme case. And if you want you know, to replicate that on like very small businesses, it usually doesn't happen for them to have it in place. So the system needs to be super simple uh, to implement yet rigorous enough to give you the desired output. Uh, tell me about, more about the ISO standard. Are you saying get an ISO standard for our product, or are you talking about just follow certain standards that are defined? No, so uh, there, there's a bunch of standards available, and there's ISO standards uh, for manufacturing, and it's like a 3,000 something. Or let me, that's risk management. Let me find the, the actual standard number. So, but the standard number is like quality control. Uh, let's see, maybe this is 9001. Is it? Okay, yeah. So, if you look up ISO 9001. Yeah. Um, it's like there's plenty of standards, but the ISO 9000 actually family is like a quality management systems and yeah, how, how you do that in factory. So essentially when someone comes to a factory, it, the factory needs to be ISO certified, which in very simplified terms means um, if you order something from a factory that follows that ISO standard, all the products should come out the same or meeting the specification you provide and stuff like that. Yep, yep. Um, have you uh, worked with ISO? Um, somewhat, but not not fully. Um, because even for us, which is, you know, as a reasonably serious engineering company, that's quite a bit of an overhead and complexity. Mm-hmm. Especially if you don't just specialize specialize 
on manufacturing. What are the costs involved a lot to get certified? And there's overhead and all that. You know the cost for getting certified ISO 9001? Well, it would be a few thousand euros usually, but it's also teaching, like introducing the process, running with the paperwork, and you actually have to keep doing it all the time. Yeah, yeah. Now, I was thinking since, since we're probably going to be more unique, then uh, we can definitely look at ISO 9001, but maybe hack it and certify in-house. So I, I was looking at it that we would do certification according to OSE procedures, which we would then uh, define in a rig rigorous way, uh, and then people can still follow. So it has to be simple enough. It has to be, yeah, it has to be pretty robust um, because it has to be simple at the same time. It does the job. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's so, a challenge. You know, one of the actual steps would be to get yourself ISO certified just for the learning experience. It's yeah. a costly one, it's a painful one. Hard to say if it's necessary or not, but yeah, you should you know, pick up some uh, cost and let's assume that it would uh, you know, cost you like 20 grand or 30 grand or something like that to try that exercise, which is quite a bit. So, yeah, yeah, I'll have to take a look at first, you know, try to understand are those standards open, openly published, or are they proprietary standards? Um, let's see. This one made quick start kit. Now we need to buy the standard. Yeah. So this one you yeah. buy. I'm not sure how much it costs, but look around. You might be able see to see at least a summary of it somewhere. That's part of the problem. Like you know, you try to learn something like this, and you don't. You know, the the industry standards don't tell you. You got to pay up. There's a little paywall on that. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah. I mean, a lot of things I've been looking at, like when. Uh, various standards for parts, like how, say, a quick coupler is made, or I don't know, whatever, whatever various things. A lot of things I ran into already. It's like, okay, you got to buy the standard. <laughs> so, uh, which, yeah, the way things are done right now. So I see, like, there's this website that kind of estimates the cost of if you put this ISO in place. Mm -hmm. It says for one to twenty-five employees, it's like five and a half grand if uh, you get a consultant that comes in and implements this for you and teaches you and there's about 48 employee hours spent estimate mm -hmm. for one to 24 person firms yeah yeah that's not bad so see like there's clear value to have this yeah um and also like again this is just speculating and thinking out loud there's one option um, let's see if there's this for three printers you can always you know plaster whichever standards your 3d printer meets not a in bad, like people care that much, right. but it could be a good uh, step. Absolutely, uh, I mean, um, we have to. Yeah. I mean, we want to to make it act uh, this. Oh, to make a bad ISO nine thousand one. Yeah, exactly. I found an article on importance of ISO nine thousand one and three D printing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm I'm all for that. To learning what the standards are to learn ourselves. And even if we don't get the formal one, we can say this, you know, we can uh, be informed about what it takes as a start. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you cannot... Yeah, uh, but you know, if you were to get yourself standardized with just the regular ISO and follow this procedure yep. with, like, even distributed manufacturing, Provided it's possible, I'm just speculating that it is. Um, could just run with that and hope that you know improves the quality of the process. I'm not saying it's a good system, and ultimately you will likely need to come up with your own one. But even with say the best market option at the moment, you could just run with 
for a while and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's it. That's true. Because, like, the, figuring this process out would be read key, say again, cold wrist drill or anything like that. If we imagine you want to have like a hundred thousand or a million products out there in the market. Right. No, absolutely. That's, um, I'll add that to the list of things. And if we do a design challenge, part of the design challenge, part of that uh, investment into the entire process would probably be that. So here's the standards and quality control procedures. Here's some, you know, a lot of the various steps that, that encourage people to see the possibility of a business. And, and that's, the way we, that's the way we want to position that, that the developers on the design challenge themselves, they're looking at it as a part-time gig or a sideline because there's a clear infrastructure being set up for the marketing and, and productization of that at the end of the day. So that would be pretty unique. And uh, I would like to see industry transformation happen on the north. Like if this experiment works, it could be, it. Um, I would see it's possible to transform an industry to open source in a period of say three years if done properly. But that's a, that's a major, major guess. And, but we'll try to see what's possible. It's definitely gotta hack the system. Exactly, because what I've seen is like really large deviations from like the current best practice. Even if your long shot like goal is far from, it's yeah. easier to take smaller steps which don't require a shift in perspective of large amounts of people because that tends to be very slow. Uh, sorry, what's what's your message about shifting the perception of people? It's just slow, so you can't do it like very large changes. You need to do incrementally small changes. Mm -hmm. How many years do you think Which... it, do you think it would take? Huh, that, that's difficult. But from another perspective, I could ask the question. Like how long does it take to become the leading 3D printer manufacturer in like in this type of printers or something like that? Right. Because if, if you can't become a leading provider in one industry, that gives you an insanely good starting point to prove the model and replicate it. Right. Right. And the way we're looking at it, like you're saying, okay, 3D printing is hard, but the, the unique value we're producing is the construction set approach. So we're talking about scalability, modularity, and I also add materials to that. So scalability, because we can scale the parts. Modularity is like, okay, we've already made a CNC circuit mill out of that, and then it's up to adding different work heads and larger machines. And then as far as materials go, we get into the materials level of producing filament because if you want to print larger things, you're going to need to make your own filament for it to be affordable. So Sure, but yeah. the question here is, does anyone care about any of those? Or it, it, it does all, like, do these things create a large enough market? Well, obviously there are I, markets that already fill those there's already markets in all those things, right? Which are multi-billion dollar markets. Sure. So we're saying... But just combined. So really figuring out if for the value proposition you have specifically, yeah, is there a large enough market and what market share can you, say, get in a year? Yeah, yeah. Right. Is it like, it's awesome what you have, but still, is there a market for it? Is there a market for it is the question. Like, for example, does anybody uh, uh, appreciate the fact that now they can have their drill for as long as they decide, not because it breaks? Um, so, yeah, so 
Yeah. Uh, is there a market? We'll find out. Exactly. So, and 3 printing may be a good start for this. Also, it's like a very difficult market, I would say, just because there's a flood of 3D printers. So it yeah. probably would be best then to start from the perspective of someone who wa wants to buy a new printer and understanding their decision process in what features are important. And then you can see if you have those features or what you need to do to either add them or at least present them in a way or you will be able to capture them. Right. And it's not the necessarily market. the 3D printer. I think there's two, two avenues. One is just the, the small enterprise that's not necessarily the industry transformer, but it provides bootstrap funding. The other part is is what, what I would like to see as the industry transformation with, a, with, say, the cordless drill or some product like that, which we are driving for that. But that, that product in itself... That's distinct from the 3D printer, but it can help the 3D printer also get sales uh, because we're showing. Okay, but okay, but what is the when you say it, is there a market? What is that market for? Because we're actually saying it's not necessarily the market for uh, cordless drills. The market is really my customer. I would say is actually the entrepreneur. The fact that we are building a large entrepreneurial community that are becoming the developers of these new products. So the way we think about is there a market, uh, that cordless drill is not necessarily the market. Uh, it's the people that would be developing that because we've set up an infrastructure for that. Um, sure, but before we go too far in that case, um, let me ask this question. So if we assume that your 3D printer would be like primarily used by small businesses to manufacture parts. And let's assume these are whatever parts they want to be doing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so first question is, are there any small businesses printing a number of parts in bulk at the moment for production purposes, not for development purposes? Um, there are some, but I think a lot of this also is market creation. So we're, 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 we're like, nah, we don't care what the markets are today because we know that um, for ex the idea of the open source microfactory or distributed production is a market that has to happen. It's a promise. It's one of the undelivered promise of 3D printing. Like people said that, oh yeah, once you get open source printers, everyone's going to go crazy and producing meaningful things. Well, that's far from the truth today, right? So it's still about creating a viable business model for that to happen. Right, so sure. so we're 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 gonna have to create the markets. Like I'm, I'm afraid a lot of what we want to do, which is, for me, the idea that we're gonna get a lot of people in production. Now we're 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 creating that. Uh, so it's a hard right. game. It's a long term game. Sure, but still, there's two key points here. Firstly, like people, your users of your printers. Let's assume today they don't know what they want they, what they want to be printing, but. Let's assume the case where there's a magical library with, say, 10,000 parts in there for, like, most common household items. Yeah. And when something breaks, you go to your local shop and the guy there figures out the way how to print that and fixes it for you. Yeah. Let's assume that magical case to be true. Yeah. If that was the case, for you to be, say, the market leader in providing those printers yeah. would likely mean you have the most reliable, sufficiently precise and well-priced printers exactly. with awesome customer support because when you go to that guy, he needs to print something. If something breaks, yep. he needs to be fixed immediately, otherwise he can't deliver. Right. So the, the part of like excellent customs, customer support yep. and like making sure it always works so as a business you have value because you're willing to pay for support or for a product that you know has like good reputation and it will always work yeah. and you will look good that's the first step and secondly is yeah what they will be printing and with that things need to evolve but it's not a magic solution that will be available now it's getting there 
Yeah, I hear that. The first thing is that has to, what you said that has to be there. That's going to be the prerequisite. But the, the other question is, if you find a case where someone is printing a large number of some parts, then you could already apply your product to such a yeah, production chain, if Absolutely. there is one. I don't know if there is one. Though. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, I don't know who's doing that. I'm sure there's some people doing that because I heard, from, for example, from Jeff from Lowe's bot, he's saying that like GM bought 500 of his printers. They're actually printing parts for cars with Lowe's bot printers. Yeah. Yeah. What what I know, for example, and what we've been doing is printing like some trays and like some essentially production utilities yeah. for pharmaceutical companies. Yeah. We've been doing quite a bit of that. Using your 3D printers? Yeah, exactly. And we've been printing like hundreds of parts. Yeah. But at the time, like we got some large orders in. What we did is we just bought like tw 10 or 20 cheapest Chinese printers for 150 US. Right. And they did the job just fine. Yeah. That's exactly right. So something has to differentiate ourselves from that. And that's going to be performance. Yeah. Yeah, for basic tasks, that's exactly right. The cheap Chinese printers are going to do it for you. Uh, but they're not going to be able to yeah. do everything. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, maybe there's an industry like, like pharmaceutical or something else. Or you could just find an industry which has a reasonably large need for 3D printed parts uh -huh. even if you need to teach them that they have that need. But if you find one where you can teach them that they have a need, is you know you can sell them printers, maintain them, and do everything yeah. with them. You could essentially run a manufacturing hub at their facility. Absolutely. Or something like that. Yeah. No, I mean, I think the, the part about our work, we're basically setting up the infrastructure for all those kinds of possibilities to happen. Um, and that's, that's why I think, uh, I do think that our stuff, because it's being designed for that, that will succeed at some point. So that's, that's what I'm working on. But make it so robust and flexible, scalable, modular, um, that that does become a possibility. And that's a much bigger yeah, package so, than having a single product for a very particular thing. So, so the the process to get there it may be a little longer. But then, of course, you got to find certain niches where okay, that's going to bootstrap you for some time, and then keep going. Yeah. So, how like I see without too much detail of what you guys have done recently yeah. is that you've gone very far in like systematic thinking and setting everything up correctly. Right. But maybe it's time to step take a step back at this or kind of pause it for a bit and go on like scaling up use cases more yeah. than the well, actual... Well, uh, wouldn't the idea of the extreme enterprise on the 3D printer itself, i.e. the efficient production engineering based enterprise, that's, that's what I'd like to scale up in an immediate sense. Would that qualify? It would, but... I would be cautious because you're still doing that within your like own world without attaching to too many external use cases. Well, um, I mean, but if the idea is that you've got, so our promise of industrial productivity on a small scale or just meeting or exceeding industry standards at a fraction of the cost, uh, if we deliver that part, isn't that a safe bet to go on? So we've got the productivity or products that can produce and they're lower cost for the same or better performance. That, I'm assuming, is going to be able to carry us, us at least somewhere. Enough to scale to a few people, like a dozen or a few dozen people. Possibly, but I still think it's missing the piece where you need like a target industry or target customer base and work towards that. 
yeah, yeah. Uh, I haven't mentioned about who the target is here, but yeah, and there's... Um, Like, say if Lowe's bot is selling to GE and car manufacturers, so unlikely you will go there, you know, just figuring out what would be the... Right. Like, a, a particular niche for you. Right. And that's that's not determined yet, where that niche is. I'd like it to be that that niche could be coincident with, like, for when we're doing, say, the cordless drill, It'll be the equipment and resources for setting people up in production to do the, what I, I call that, the open source everything store. Like Amazon is the everything store. So be the open source everything store. So basically setting up small distributed manufacturing. Um, that's that's kind of like the tentative um, market, but it's, it's not well defined. That could be one. I'd like that to be a significant part eventually. Um, I guess you can say we're working towards that. But, the, the, for example, the cordless drill challenge would be dedicated exactly to that. We're going to create a wide participation in this design process. And these people are going to want our services and products, uh, the printers, or the infrastructure for getting into, into production. So I'd like to be more the guy who creates the distributed production capacity. True, like I fully agree with that plan. I'm just not sure if you can take that step immediately without proving you your production capacity in some other market before. Because right, right. doing the core world challenge and getting yeah. to that point yeah. is a lengthy process. Yeah. And before that scales up to be produced in, say, thousands of units or you know, hundreds of thousands of units. It can easily be five years. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that yeah. So you're pointing out good good uh, points about sequencing of this whole thing. Yeah. So it's worth to consider what's the ideal case and what's like the immediate case and probably yeah. something sensible I is mean, halfway in between the two. Yeah. I mean, immediate is what we. What we know is that this is just selling kits. I mean, there's markets for that. So that's the absolute low-hanging fruit at this point. And we can continue doing that. Sure, but the, the added value on the kit is minimal compared to everything else. Well, that's... Um, uh, it's minimal compared... What do you mean by that? It means like if you sell a finished and certified product, then your added value is much higher than if you sell a kit. You sell a kit for a thousand, you can sell a assembled one for two thousand or something like that. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's true. That's true. Also, like you, you mentioned the tractor. You said if you had like one point six million US. You could build a tractor for 500? Yeah. What I'm estimating like, there is the development cost for that still. Sure, but like, how, how confident are you that that would be it? That, that's, that budget is sufficient? Yeah. Uh, if I haven't done it, I can't be confident, but that, that's my estimate if I look at the, the R&D time for X number of people, essentially. It's okay. Like, it's like, so, so just, yeah. You know, widely estimating. But if you were, say, to run a Kickstarter campaign for a thousand US per tractor, do you think you could sell like two thousand of them? Yeah, if I could deliver that for, for that tractor for that price uh well i assume 500 for the parts and yeah. 500 for development um if it's 500 for the parts that does not include how you're going to build it right so that part is missing from that equation i can just compare that okay now it costs okay. 10,000 in parts we're going to get the parts down 
to 500. So you still have to. Oh, okay. Yeah. So you still have to account okay, but... for that, um, which means if you're gonna. Still, do it... let, let's assume it's like two grand, okay? So you have 500 for development, a thousand for production cost, and 500 for equipment or for parts. Uh, the development cost is uh, that that would be the 1.6 million. Essentially, like uh, 16 people for one year, or four people for four years, working full-time engineers. 16 in one year, building a full tractor. Huh. No, 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 no. R and D. Yeah, yeah R and D together. Yeah, yeah, R and D, R and D. I know, I know. Yeah. That's still, I would say, quite optimistic. It is quite optimistic, and then, uh, yeah, it is quite optimistic. Well, But in, in any case, like if you take that cost and assume what, like for how much you could sell, say a thousand tractors to cover the development, it may not be as large number that people would buy it to support the project, not because they need the tractor. Sorry, it w what wouldn't be as large a number? So I'm saying if it's a thousand or two thousand euros per tractor. Or you know, some not not too large number, but sufficiently big to get you the development cost, and you can deliver the tractors. Uh -huh. uh, then you may find that like a thousand people to pre-order them or something like that. Yeah, it's true. It's true. Now the question there is, of course, the fulfillment method. How do you do it? Because because in this method, the idea is we're setting up for the small distributed production initially un until you build that up those facilities are not going to be there so so you have to build in exactly how are we building that tractor are we building that through our same type of extreme manufacturing model where people come in like say a dozen people build a, a dozen tractors over a weekend that part has to be uh quantified in there too so it wouldn't be like we're, we're not going to produce a thousand tractors off a production line it would still be the the small scale production model where you might make 12 tractors over a weekend. So that we have to accommodate that. Cause what you're talking about, like I think is, I mean, if you did the production line, that would be an expensive facility. We're talking about minimal facilities with a lot of skill and digital equipment there, but the volumes are very low, like a dozen over a weekend, which is actually still sure, more but... efficient than big industrial plants. <laughs> If we assume doing a thousand tractors, right? Yeah. You can do it on ten locations, hundred each. Yeah. That validates your model plus gets your tractors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. No, that's right. And you're suggesting that's something like that. Are you suggesting that that's something to go for right now? If you like, I would say this is a bit of a far shot. But if you can you know, run the numbers, you end up with a tractor that's not too expensive, basically for people that have like a grand or two or three grand spare and support your idea, are willing to commit, then you could get to a hundred or you know, a thousand tractors in say two years with the development cost covered, plus the motivation to set up this manufacturer. And very likely if you will sell a thousand tractors up front, there will be another thousand when this kind of starts rolling, so that this manufacturing can keep going. Working on it. That's that's what I'm going to be writing about in my book. I'm going to propose uh, several scenarios like this. Uh, so I was thinking about various proposals. Like I threw out the 1.6 million, but I also remember, like for example, the th that assumes that the 3D printer is there because we're going to be printing the rubber for it and and seats and sure. other plastic things. So yeah, it's a uh, um, that's exactly what I'm working for. And, and yes, you will see something of that effect. It's not going to be now, I think. For now, I think uh, the low-hanging fruit was there with... Um, uh, the way I'm thinking about it is low-hanging fruit was with, with a simple mass participation model like an cordless drill where everyone has access to a 3D printer. You know, so... Sure. So that would be something that's, I think, a great experiment. The tractor part, that is much more ambitious right now. Yes, but yes. but would you uh, are you saying that hey we should do that like right now or are you saying that's for down the road? Huh. So I can't answer that for you, but that's like a 
moonshot, to put it that way. If it, it works, it would yeah. be amazing, but it can, yeah, backfire horribly as well. Uh, it backfire, is a moonshot. But it can just fail yeah. horribly. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. So that's why, like, we're going very slowly at, at this. Uh, so I'm looking at all this to be to have happened by within 10 years. But uh, so another decade of GVCS, Global Village Construction Set Development. Yeah. Um, so now absolutely build up the baseline of the 3D printing up to very scalable, up to the point that we're building construction panels with 3D printers, and then up to the heavier but machinery it, it, and induction. Is furnace. that sufficient? Is that in any way efficient to build large panels with 3D printers? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Based on the extrusion rates uh, and the assumption that it's if you're recycling plastic, you're going to be spending 10 cents per kilowatt hour uh, or like about 10 cents, 5 cents per pound for, for virgin plastic filament. So, so the numbers add up if you're making your own filament because it's essentially your your electricity cost for melting the plastic. So I think it does. I, I ran through some numbers. Um, no, but, uh, what I'm so. just saying is, do we need 3D printing? Wouldn't it make more sense then to build like a mold in a very low cost way or something like that and just do it the other no, way? No, I don't think so because you're going to end up with huge, huge capital investment costs because because now you talk about the 3D printer that's printing rubber tires, that's printing houses, that's printing cordless drills. It's, it's the multi-purpose versus dedicated equipment question. Uh, sure, but I'm saying if you have a printer that will print a mold for the tire. Yeah. Okay, but why not, um, why not invest in as little as possible if it's possible as long as it's like automated and energy balance works out at the end of the day when you have automation uh, i don't see a case for okay within the open source micro factory so the assumption here is that you have a micro factory in every city and they can you know it's like maybe a ten thousand square foot facility and it can produce just about anything up to advanced materials um so yeah pretty advanced fabrication i understand that idea i'm not entirely All on that. board that it makes sense to say how to say use this really basic tools where three printers basic tool where like you don't build any machine for building parts for a particular product but you just have multi-purpose machines for the general use wow that's the central case of uh, the second industrial divide. Uh, you know that book? Uh, no. Yeah, read it, but it's basically about the case for how the economic model of flexible fabrication can be competitive with centralized production. So, I mean, here, what it seems like you're saying, okay, let's use some of these standard things like how centralized production does it because that could be more valuable. Uh, well, I think depending on how you set up your economic system, there's different ways to do that. You can have a, a very a, de, a very skilled system where generalized production machinery makes just about anything as opposed to very ex expensive equipment and unskilled labor. So that's the kind of game we're playing here. We're saying, okay, let's, let's use this multi-purpose machinery and do magical things with it. Uh, because it's possible and, po and possibly desirable if we talk about the relocalized economy, which is uh, one of the assumptions I have is that the only way you can have environmental uh, non-externalizations, the only way you're going to internalize the environment is if the economies go more local because otherwise the effects of your actions are just simply not transparent. So if you see an immediate feedback loop of how you're treating the environment, uh, based on what you do in your community and your local production, I don't see uh, us getting sane about the environment unless we go to local production. So I think that local um, high-tech production is the key, key to environmentalism because then uh, we start taking care of the environment because we start recognizing that that's where all the, the feedstocks come from. So part of that is the sure. assumption sure. here, which means, okay, we're going to try to develop a system that really maximizes this general purpose and small scale aspects of it 
so that's I mean that's kind of like the value proposition, like like internalizing much more of the, the economics into this whole uh, manufacturing package. Sure, I understood. I was yeah. trying to make a different point. Yeah. Just saying, if say back to tractor tires, yeah, if you you need to make you know a hundred tractor tires. And likely, if you're doing local manufacturing, you're not just building one tractor, but you may be building 10 or 20 yeah. or something like yeah. that. If you need 100 tires, you can still use the same approach, but may build a mold with the 3D printer and whatever tools you have there yeah. over one weekend, and then do 100 tire, tires in the mold or something like that. Yeah. Or, for example, if you need to build like seats or panels of some yeah. size, it still may be more efficient. What I'm simply saying is, it, I find it difficult to argue that using a 3D printer to build like square blocks of material, like panels or something like that, unless they have like a very advanced internal structure or like some structural properties which are beyond the box shape, makes very much sense. Right. No, I, I'd agree with you, but that's where you can make integrated paneling systems. Like, for example, if it's the the panels for the greenhouse, they might have the glazing, the structure, the shelves, and say, you know, other features like the plumbing built into them. So so that's where you can get that amazing efficiency. This actually occurred to me the other day because I was thinking, okay, if we can melt polycarbonate from scrap CDs and then, you know, make filament out of that, why not print uh, polycarbonate multi-wall panels? Great. Okay, but what about like a two or three headed printer where you mixing the materials and you're building the structure and the glazing, and then the shelving and the plumbing all in one panel. So, uh, sure, I think but, we're... but that, that, that's a new product. That's like, how to say this is like a high, yeah, it's a high tech solution essentially, which you yeah. can't efficiently manufacture with any other method. So, yeah. That's then a key differentiator that you can't just use a smart machinery to build like the same type of products that we know today, but you, yeah, you need you're gonna, the completely fresh design of the products. And I think that that's the key you're right. differentiator. So, well. for example, for the tires, we can print airless tires where you cannot make a mold for a thing that has internal, internal uh, cavities. Right. Exactly. So, and yeah. things like that. And then I would say, okay, I can't make that any other way but with printing. So it's clear what needs to be used and it has clear advantages because we've been able to use the material for like much more complex and more structures than yeah. just the yeah. regular old thing we know. Right, right. Exactly. Because then like your tool set and everything you've built supports that fully exactly well but that's what i'm trying to say i'm saying that we're not i mean the construction set part that's a hard sell because you know like you're you're asking me okay well what's the product you're gonna make with it but that's the that's the point uh we can go into so many different markets and have so much uh opportunity that that i think the primary thing to do is get the damn tools out there um so that can start happening we're still at the tools level you know uh, yeah. But I do agree that, of course, we're going to have to bootstrap ourselves some way uh, or get investment some way. Uh, and that means uh, all values created at a point of sale. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but the construction set approach is what, what's going to be allowing us to do all this flexibility. Like, that's why, like, I wouldn't be too concerned about, okay, if uh, are we competing against Lowell's bot? Well, um not really they've got their niche we're gonna have a niche of okay say maybe we do the first like for example to give you one example uh, there is no three millimeter durometer 60 extruder that i know of at least i.e for soft okay. rubber there is no three millimeter extruders that exist and that's going to be part of the development we're going to have to do because we want to print significantly with with very soft rubber and three millimeter filament that we can also recycle so that kind of stuff. It's like th these differentiators that get us to performance that is otherwise not possible with pack with canned systems, you know? Yeah, agreed. But say if we put the airless tire together yeah. with the 3D printer, for example, yeah. 
if you were able to make a 3D printer that prints airless tires as a replacement for all the like tractors, motorbikes, wheelbarrows, whatever like you pick today, yeah. you have a very clear business case because yeah. people and shops yeah. will be getting that printers just to be printing that one design which you can also supply. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, so that's a great case. There I see a clear business strategy. And it has nothing to do with if your printer is open source, if what you're doing is open source, it's completely unrelated to that. It's all about the final utility. And obviously all of those things are important because you're trying to create an example of like a different value set. But essentially if you were to make a let's say we create a startup today. Okay, which is not related to anything, but has a nice shiny page promising a machine for, I don't know, five grand or ten grand that can print replacement tires for this range of tractors. Right. You could easily sell that, I think. Yeah, yeah. And you would probably get an order from every larger village in Africa or something like that. Right. Except not from Africa, but yeah. Um, well, you know, places which are not super central EU or US where you can buy a tire everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, but the open source, uh, it doesn't, I mean, doesn't an open source matter for the case of, okay, now we can have distributed or distributive. I use the word distributive, meaning that we're open about distributing the business model itself. So you can buy the product or buy the production of that product. Uh, that's important, isn't it? Not to the people that would be buying it initially. Not to the buyers, but to producers. No, no like, I mean, not, not even to producers, because they would see a clear business case to be able to produce tires. So if they're buying a machine, they're buying the means of production anyway. So it, it does not matter to them immediately if the 3D printer is open source or not. It just needs to do what it needs to do. And obviously through open source, you can convince them that it's more robust that way that they can service it. That there's you know, the whole range of very well-known benefits uh, to doing things so. Right. But the first... The first requirement is, does it do its job? Yeah, and that's well, when you're talking about the mass market, because then there's going to be other early adopters who are, um, or are there? Is there any other market besides the mainstream market? Because what, what you're describing is the mainstream people who just want a product that works. Uh, is there anyone yeah. else that would buy it outside of, main, say, mainstream people? I don't think so. No, not in, not at least initially. So you would get if you were to you know set up production for one type of product. Even though you're selling a 3D printer which can be used for everything, forget the the for everything part, and you just sell it for one particular purpose. You have a very clear business strategy there, and a very clear like market definition. And then people figure out, hey, this is useful for other things. Yeah. And you can start launching the other things at a later point. Yeah. But if you start with, say, hey, this does everything, you get the so what response because no one sees it clearly. What do you think? Uh, do you think there's any particular angle? Like, okay, if you look at our, say we want to sell kits of the 3D printer, um, and then leaving aside the question of, okay, what if we sell the finished product? Uh, let's leave that question aside. What do you think would be a good angle to? Do you have any suggestions on when we're selling kits? What, how to, how to um, market it? Well, definitely not as the cheapest thing because this right. is what the Chinese solutions are for. Right. So it's not your place to take essentially. Right. Uh, the other option is. I don't know, like school education friendly, which yeah. I guess has been covered as well right. and may not be uh, applicable to you. Most aligned with what you're trying to do is 
optimized for like small businesses and things like that. But that means you need to very well understand the small businesses, their like worries, problems, and what they value most. Mm-hmm. Which is customer support, reliability, serviceability, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can say, like, I have a project, I'm buying a machine, and this is my experience. Okay, I'm buying, like, a CNC router or something like that. I will buy the one that is most probable to work most reliably because I need to do some other job. I don't care. And I will always buy an open source one if I can make the argument that it is as reliable as the current state of technology on the market. And I've never found the case for that. Like, really, it's super difficult to find open source products which are actually the best products on the market. And that's what we want to change. That's what I want to change, man. That's true. Well, but what about, for example, uh, Lulzbot? Yeah, it's still not there. What are you comparing it to? Oh, it's been a while, but like when I compare it to, it's just yet another like extrusion mode printer. Uh-huh. Um, and compare the same prints and things you get from like commercial printers, and usually the magic is in software and all those things where where open source slicers don't really get close to is the magic you have there. Uh, tell me more about that. Like, what what have you seen about that point? Isn't slicing like a, slicing or no? So slicing is one thing, but slicing and like post processing everything with the material behavior and properties, and the companies that really fine tune that have exceptionally nice prints. Uh huh. Can you give me an example? They're really good. Uh, I'll need to dig things up. It's been like a year or two since I've been looking at that. Uh huh. Compared to all other open source printers. And like Ultimaker, I guess, has come the furthest in terms of like being high quality printer, which does not seem to be that open source anymore. Although it is. Well, not necessarily. It's not open source. The software is. Um, Yeah, I'm not sure if their latest printers are open source or not. I've not checked for a long time. Yeah, no, the, the printer themselves, printers themselves are not uh, for Ultimaker, you're saying? Yeah, but right. as far as I've seen in some of the recent printers, they also do quite a bit of magic in the firmware, so the part of the printer that's not open source that essentially does post-processing on the G-code, if I understand correctly, I'm not sure. Um, what are the, some of the practical features? What, what do you mean? With, what kind of post processing? It means that, like, even if the slice, like slicer, gives you some results in G code, yeah. But in the control software, they seem to be doing some processing of that as well to improve printing and stuff like that. Which company? Ultimaker. So, I think I've seen something like that. Um. On oh, some of their printers, I'm not sure again yeah. which version. Oh, Definitely no, not I mean, late. So they're using. They put out Cura. So you're talking about Cura? No, I'm talking about the controller board that's inside the printer. You're saying the controller board actually improves over the the G code? May do some things. I'm not sure if it's reading it straight off. Yeah, and you're not referring to things like silent printing or like remembering, like if power goes out, like those other features? No, not, not those features, but see, because 
one thing is you have the G code, and one thing is the G code interpreter, which is inside the machine. And there's quite a lot of things you can do there to improve things. Uh huh. But are you talking about simply about just optimizing printing profiles for like all accelerations and just fine physical artifacts of how you go about a proper print? Yeah, and also just do, doing the like two paths, corners, material flow optimization, yeah. cooling, stuff like that. You can do all of that there. Right. right, right. So I don't know how much they do there, but there's a lot that can be done. Yeah, like for example, uh, I still believe that you can print horizontally if you have the right combination of speed and fan power. Um, nobody's done that yet. Yeah. <laughs> um, right. Right. Yeah. So again, not, not sure if this is the entirely good example, but maybe the closest we have to something that resembles open source. Uh, although it's not. Right. But what I'm still missing is, say, like, if I say I want to buy the best, hard to think of something, but it, out of all, like, production tools, you want to say I want to buy the best for some particular application, it rarely is the one that is also open source. And oh, also yeah. No, I mean, that's that's the problem. I mean, that's the perennial problem that once somebody has an excellent product, everything goes close, close source. I mean, that's that's part of the culture that we're in. True. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do is if you want to actually make the best product, you need quite a bit of money for that. And, and that, that, is an, that is an yeah. artifact. Close source um, is difficult. Yeah. Well... My conclusion on that is that's a cultural phenomenon of how people behave, right? Uh, it's not. Yeah. It's that we have not yet come up with a methodology for that. So in this design challenge that we're uh, planning on a cordless drill or whatever that will be, uh, we're going to try to address that, what you just said, and that is the fact that no best product in the world yet is open source. And yeah. that's that is what at least we want to change for this planet. Because <laughs> I yeah, observe very clearly I that would very much love to see that. See what? I would very much love to see that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we still have to I'm see not that. sure what the route to that is. So I would not necessarily agree that you developing something from scratch and making it the world's best product is more feasible than finding the words best product and making it open source. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that, because for example, for the, the cordless drill, that would be the case, right? We're taking a known set of functions and we're making that open source, right? No, but I'm saying if you find, say, a Devolt or some other reasonably almost best cordless drill on the market yeah and make it open source so actually make the company that built it open source it oh you mean make them open source it oh yeah you think you would say that that would be the the preferred route i'm not saying whether it may as well be more feasible than the first one okay but but does that get us to any of the philosophical points we want to achieve with open source soft, open source hardware, which is distribution of economic wealth? Because, okay, just because you have an open source DeWalt drill, does that mean that anyone benefits benefits from it? How is anyone else benefiting from it if it's still the centralized model? It's not because as soon as you make it open, everyone can start manufacturing. Yeah, uh, so obviously, it's very unlikely DeWalt would agree to that, unless something magical happens. No, it would have to be a different business model, a different framework for producing it would have to be... Um, no, they, their business model would have to change. Sure, so um, it may be possible if you find the, you know, if you're at the right point in time talking to the right person of a right company 
that there is a combination like that that could happen. Right. Um. Because it may, like, what I'm saying is, it may be easier to convince a closed source company to become open source than, than to convince the whole market that something new you built is better than everything else. Why do you call Even it if new? Because it's, I mean, it's based on industry standards, so why do you call it new? You're just saying it's, that... It's not new, it's a new brand, but, but okay, new, new team, brand, it's yeah. unproven, it has no history, right. has no support, has no sales channels, has no shops, right. no online reviews, all of those things. Like, right. e even if, say, even if I were to give you the best cordless drill design today with full sources, and you have it, and you can start manufacturing it in any possible way, you would be still missing all the key components for it to become the best. Okay, exactly. But that's where the, the design process has very little to do with technology. It would have a lot to do with the marketing and uh, commercial aspects of it. So the, exactly. the design challenge has to be focused on those other elements in a significant way. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what we're looking at for for this thing. So yeah, not not too much of it is going to be though, though significant because nobody still has an open design. But that's that's not the hard hard part. Yeah, it's significant, but it's not super hard to do that. The harder part yeah, will be the other it, elements. One mechanism would be if you have enough budget. Yeah. You go to China or somewhere, and you just buy a design. Or you buy it like a few generations older design from somewhere, or you no, know, convince someone to give it for, to you for free. Um. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's one way to go. Uh, I'm not sure how. Um. I'm not sure how relevant or useful that is in a case where the product is not especially complicated. And that was part of the reason why we chose the cordless drill, because it's not particularly complicated, you know? True. Yeah. We're not uh, inventing a new wireless optical system. <laughs> no, that's what I'm saying. This is like the ultimate complexity of what you can do. So uh, it's definitely good to start simpler. Yeah. But even in cordless drills, like, there's a thousands of different designs today. Right. And if you're not inventing something new, well, why are all of the others different? Or at least, are they different? Well, but it has to do with what you just taught, told about the super high quality printers. It's about the fine tuning of a lot of the things, like for example, lightweight or a good algorithm for how it uses power so it lasts longer. And sure. th those various yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Which, I mean, in theory, the open world should be, like, if you get a lot of con contributions to that, if you really stimulate a lot of development on it, in principle, you can do better. That's the theory. Uh, the question is how much money it would take to, to motivate so many people to put a sufficient number, amount, number of hours into that development. Um, yeah, but, but the hope there is that it'll be lower than somebody just hiring a bunch of people. Yeah. And also, does anyone care enough about cordless drills that they would actually contribute? Right. Um, because also, that's an important aspect. For example, if we look at Starek and like the medical devices and all that, yeah. these are like very, how to say, emotionally involved yeah. projects. Right. It may be easier to get traction and like Sean, like the radiation and so forth. Who's Sean? Again, very Sean Bonner, safe cost project. Okay. Uh, he's also, well, one of the alumni fellows. Um, so they're doing like the open source radiation monitoring in Japan, uh, yeah. Fukushima and all that. Um, and it's also quite easy for them to get traction. 
because it's an, an emotional topic where people get involved. Yeah. No, it's like personal safety and all that. People care much more about personal safety than cold cordless drills. Yeah. We just don't know how much people care about cordless drills. Right. No, it's true. That's uh, it has to be emotionally engaging enough. Yeah. It may be, so I'm not saying it's not, it's just hard to assess if it is. Right. And maybe the only way is actually just trying and seeing the traction. Yeah. Is the is safe cast that's is that fully open source? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there's plenty of thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what could happen? So. All right. So yeah, let me think about yeah any topics for collaboration. How is it keep me posted? Um, yeah. What's happening? And uh, yeah, let's be in touch for email. I'll Ping me some ideas if I come across something. Yeah. And likewise, happy to chat at any point. Yeah, that's that's great. So one thing just to follow up, there was oh yeah, so Tarek's contact, and then maybe yeah. if you have the example of the great printer, like some of those features that stood out to you. Um, if if you have that as an example of what what like really good would be. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay. All right, Luca. Well, thanks no. a lot. So yeah, we'll be no, in touch. No mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Have a good day. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. -bye.